And um, I don't quite know how, but I met Richard, probably on the internet. Um, was oh, yeah. <laughs> so Richard is a Jerseyman who moved to France 16 years ago. He lives in Crossai, which is about 13 miles southwest of St. Malo. And I started beekeeping nine years ago with one hive, and I've now got three and a half. Richard started beekeeping with three hives nine years ago, and he's now got 300 colonies. So we're talking about a completely different ball game. And, um, He's going to give us a presentation on his methods and then possibly a little discussion. He's also got a short presentation on Asian audit if you want to watch that later, but this is the predominant one that we're going to talk. So, Richard Noll, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's all I'd like to wish you all a very warm welcome for uh, this freezing cold night of February. Uh, if we could do questions at the end of the talk, I'd be grateful, but I'll hopefully have time then. And please excuse me if I stumble a bit because I'm not actually used to doing much public speaking and it's all pretty daunting towards me. So um, I hope we can get through this. I'm going to stick to the presentation and just take my time and I hope you'll find it entertaining. My whole goal of this is I want everyone who can raise queens to have a go. Because to me, raising queens is as much as important as inspecting the hive or it helps you understand the whole complex issue of the colony and you end up being better because the beekeepers for doing it. So let's go on with the presentation. So Queen Rearing in Brittany in France. There's uh, this is I just I like to keep this frame because it's this is a at the end of my cell building cycle I, I get better graphs right at the end of the year for some reason. I don't quite know why. But this is just an example of what of the results you can get. This hasn't been jiggled around but this is as this is the frame that went into the cell builder and that came out of the cell builder. So it shows the acceptance of the size of the cells. And if you look here, you can see um, the cells are all full of royal jelly, which is what I'm going to go on and tell you about. They're all full of food at the day you harvest the cells. That's what you want. So I'm going to start off by also telling you a little bit about myself, what I do where I run my beekeeping business and the kind you'll see from uh, the next few slides of what I do before I actually go into the cell building method. Okay, so this is where I live. My actual house is just under that blue dot. Um, and this my hamlet is called Teddy and we are surrounded by a valley. We have a, a wonderful fauna and flora. We are a little bit high up here, but I have two acres. Uh, keep pressing on the excuse me. I have two acres, one which is uh, in this wood here, another one just up there, and I do my cell building right at my home here. So there's uh, our local village. It's a, a Roman Gallo village, uh, and you can see we have um, some ruins you can visit and things like that, a bit of interest. Here we are, in relation to you guys, that's me, the, the dot there. And so I'm not far from Somalia, you can see Sankar, all the other places. My apiaries run roughly in that sort of circle there. So it's quite a big area. I managed to keep about three kilometers between each apiary. So in terms of disease, if we do get any, we like to think that we can control any outbreaks. We have very little, but we also have, we have issues like uh, forage. We don't have enough forage. We have two nectar flows a year, which I'll show you more in a moment. But the nectar flows are usually from, like you hear, from about mid-April to the end of May for us, when we have all the right and everything just explodes. Then we have a gap, we call it the June gap, and then we have the chestnut and the summer honey, which starts in mid-June to mid-July. Anyway, there we are. That's uh, another section where I live. So my apron is all about there. That's where my house is still. And you can see uh, we have a workshop approximately there. So I, um, we have, at the moment I have 14 acres, they're mostly rural, so we get a really good spring and summer, uh, a wide variety of pollens with two main nectar flows. It's situated near small villages and hamlets, and that's what I do when I'm looking for acreage sites. I go, to, uh, I go to places where I know there's the field crops like orchid grape, like maize, which is a quite important crop for us for pollen at certain times in, you know, in, in mid-July. I also go it's a place where I know there's new villages, because when you go to villages, you get people with gardens, and people with gardens go to garden centres and buy shrubs. And it's those pollens from those shrubs that are so important, because they're a diverse pollen. They're not a bold standard pollen, it's the diversity we want. All the research now is talking about diet and, and feed, and how the best, um, the best colonies seem to be doing best in non-migratory non apiaries. 
In other words, they're not moved anywhere, they're, they're static, but they're static in a place where there's good forage. So they're not having to go to almonds, they're not having to go for cranberries, they're not, all this moving is, is really turning out to be really tricky for bees. So there you go, that's some of the pollens we get. I also like this slide because this uh, pollen was tracked right uh, in 2016, I think it was, where uh, a local farmer had planted a huge uh, five hectares of orchid grape right next to this hive that I harvested this pollen from, and yet you can see it's the yellow pollen that's the orchid grape, and that shows you how diverse, A, how diverse the pollens are, but also how incredible the bees are, that they don't just go for the nearest thing, they want to get different pollens, they want to be harvesting different pollens because they know they need that diversity, excuse me. So, just to give you some idea what, what pollens we get as well, we get uh, dandelions in the spring. Not every year we have a big dandelion crop, but most years we get a fair few. And that usually uh, does coincide with the oilseed grape. Vast stretches of oilseed grape uh, that, that usually start in about two weeks time. That's sort of mid, mid to late March. The problem we have is, like a lot of people here, because it all depends on the state of our colonies and how the winter's been. <coughs> if our colonies are overwintered well on good, good sized clusters and they're in a state to profit from the early oilseed rate, they just do, they boom, they go enormous. Often we don't get any actual um, oilseed rate honey until the last two weeks of the nectar flow. But that's sometimes better because the problem is, as you well know, oilseed rate crystallizes really rapidly. So we aim to just keep through, we aim to swap frames over in our colonies, balance things out, keeps things going, maybe make some early nukes with queens we've got from the previous year, but we aim to get our colonies all at the same state early in the year so that when the next flow does come along and we're ready for it, the colonies are all the same, we put our supers on for two to three weeks and then we harvest. Because if you don't harvest the old seed rate after four weeks and it's cold, it crystallises in the frames and then you've either got to reheat it or you've got to scrape it out and, and feed it back to the beans. And it's a nightmare. So you have to be on the move, absolutely. So, along comes the gap I talked about, we have this gap where we make, we make splits after the spring nectar flow, and then comes along the chestnut. Now, chestnut to us is like the dream plant, because everybody loves chestnut honey, but for us it's not just chestnut, we have the bramble at the same time. So we don't have the really strong, almost insipid chestnut flavoured honey, we have honey that's got a quite nice, strong but mellow flavour, and you're more than welcome to have a taste after, by the way. I bought some pots so you can see what it's like. It goes like when it, it does crystallise, but over the course of about three or four months. And if you obviously you keep it cool, you, and if you do some some work on it, you can keep it uh, more liquid. But this this chestnut is in huge abundance everywhere. We get trees like this, and they start in, in about basically mid June to, to last about mid July, and that's the valleys we get. You get valleys like this, just full of chestnut, and then every tree is a chestnut tree. And there's brambles in all the hedgerows, and they're all flowering at the same time. If you get if you get it right and it, it's warm and wet, you can get a really good nectar flow. So um, some pictures of some apiaries. This is uh, a, a new apiary I installed last year, but I filled it with some newts at the start. But these are ones I made last year as well. So just to explain a bit, generally what we work, you see these cardboard um, mulches there. That's uh, like we. Basically, they're a byproduct from the supermarket. When you buy, if you buy bottles of Coke or you buy bottles of fizzy pop, those come in on on pallets that are that have these. We get loads of these. Okay, loads. Of, they're called. Um, oh, I forget their name. Sorry, but they're basically um, a byproduct. So we can have as many as we want. We pay the, the supermarket guy a few quid, and we get like literally 150 at a time. So they mulch the apiary. So we only, we only got a mow. This bit, which is pretty quick. On top of that, we have tyres. Now, for us, where we are, tyres are unlimited. You just go to your local, there's a local tyre guy, you have to skip to them taken away, they have to pay for them to take away, so they're more than happy. And what the tyres do, they protect, they make a barrier between the, the pallet and the floor. And because they're circular, they sit down really well. And so if you get an area that's a bit um, undulating or not, not quite flat, they're, they're a good base. And also, if you're working with a mower, they seem to absorb the vibrations. So they're a really, really good base. It's a great thing to have for what we use. And on top of that, we have a pallet. And on top of that, there's our bees. And that's kind of the setup we have. And all our apiaries. So we're constantly finding pallets, finding, like every other beekeeper, it's always got your head in the skin. That kind of thing. <laughs> 
So uh, this is uh, an example of one of my acreage where we, we've got a summer harvest here. Um, I've actually got some of these Nico bases there. This is what we use in France. Everyone has, they're all Daniel hives, so I didn't explain. We all run Daniels. We don't tend to run the land drop, but that, uh, Nico, to make all the Queen Marine kit, also make plastic hives, but the bases they make have turned out to be like a revelation. They're absolutely fantastic because they never rot, they resist um, everything. You can bleach them, you can caustic soak them, and they don't seem to affect the integrity of them. And you, you never have to change them, basically, but you can sterilize them. And in the winter, you can shut them off. Uh, if you, I, for instance, close all my bases and my hives about this time, because I believe if you get a cold, windy spell like right now, the queen's starting to brood, you want to help stop getting drafts underneath it. That's just, that's just my personal thing. But we also close them off for, I use oxalic acid as a treatment against mites. So I need to get a seal underneath that base. So you just come along and close off the bases. Then you can also use it as a mite monitoring tray. So that's kind of how we work things. You see this here is a double, a double um, colony. That's, that's five over five. And that's what I used for my finishers when I was raising queen cells. You'll see more of that after. But in, in like in every every A3, there's always one that doesn't perform because it's swarmed or something. You know, it, it's I'm no different than everybody else. I have exactly the same problem. I have the odd hive here and there that does odd things. You know. So this is a new A3 I installed spring last year. It was just to show that these were brand new hives I put into circulation. We put nucleus colonies in first. When they grew in April, we transferred them to um, to main hives, and they would have given summer honey. That's kind of how we work. And one more picture of another apiary really close to me. Just that's uh, that's summer honey as well. So we, I used to put a, a, a membrane down on the ground, and I sometimes still do. But actually, when you come, to, the weeds still tend to grow through it eventually. So now we're going for the cardboard, eco, re renewable um, things. So another apiary. Uh, this is a, in a wonderful place. I started there last year. This is a surround, I've chatted to one of you guys before, and this is surrounded by gorse and wetlands, and it, the, the bees just do amazing here. It's like a fantastic place. So here we have a mating, we have a mating station, and uh, we set this up about May time when we start to see drones in our colonies. And uh, you can see these are all mini plus hives. I've got some companies down there, you can have a look at after you can, you're more than welcome. But we tend to bring in stocks from outside that are good, we select them. And we take out the rubbish stuff and put them far away so that those drone, drones that we're producing will hopefully make with the queens we're producing. So this is our workshop, doesn't look much from the front, but inside we've got uh, uh, storage for a lot of equipment. You need a lot of supers. You need, I haven't, even though I'm new in the beekeeping professional world, I have, for instance, only technically one super per hive in that hive I've got. So next room, for instance, I've got to actually use some of my colonies in a different way. I've got to, I've got to make other colonies with them. I've got to split them earlier, but, but I can do because I'll be strong enough. But I can utilize that resource rather than hoping I've got enough super. So I haven't. So I'm better off doing that than with the money I make from those. I might more super to follow you. So uh, you have to be diverse in the way you, you manage your system. But that's just an example. This is, you know, we, in the winds behind there, we do a lot of painting of pollen and stuff like that. This is a, the honey extraction unit. Now, I'm not here to, to discuss honey extraction, but uh, very briefly, um, we have frames here that are the plastic French frames, they're back to cat, they're cool. But they come in on, we, we palletize most stuff. So here, everything is on semi pallet with the wrong one. So once we arrive at the honey unit, we can unload off the truck. It's getting on the truck at the other end, that's the problem. Once we've got it on the truck and, it, and it's unloaded, it's fine. We put it onto wheel trolleys, it goes through, and it arrives just here. And then we, we unbox it, then each frame goes with this decapper. And the decapper is a, a spinning twin flanges like this, and then the frame comes through the middle of it and it scratches the surface, and then all the honey that's produced goes, well, sorry, all the, all the wax cappings and, and what we call the dross, all the, all the juice that comes off the honey, all the honey, get, goes into the honey spinner. And you can see there, there's a lot of honey in that bucket because the honey spinner is so efficient it does two jobs. It, it, it produces honey and otherwise it recuperates it quickly from the wax. And then in here we have to empty out the wax every second or third day, but the wax is clean and dry. We don't have to have it sitting around draining. So then the frames are unloaded, they go into the twin extractors.
there are, I think, 30, 35, 36 frame extractors. And then from there, as they work, they go into a sump. Now, this sump has these bits here called, called baffles. And basically, it's like a big tank, and as the honey arrives at one end, it filters through by gravity. And then the, uh, the pump, then when the float clicks on, the pump fills the barrel. But we also get wax on the barrel. So when the barrel's been standing around for a day or so, we come along and just scrape the wax off the top, and then the honey is clean. That's all we have to do to get the honey clean. You don't have to have a huge... My, my, my point of showing this, this slide is you don't have to have a huge setup. And the problem is because our honey flows are so short, and the amount of expense you, you, would, you could end up investing in a lot of equipment for such a small amount of extraction, even though we might end up extracting 30, 40 barrels between us in a year, which is our kind of what we would hope we'd have, it doesn't matter if it takes a bit longer because you can't afford and you can't justify the expense of these. There's other equipment around. If we have to replace it, yes, we'll, we'll go to more, perhaps more, more, more method. You can't do that when you're running a small, a small business. You have to be absolutely realistic. So, so there it has, there's the, uh, the sumps. The honey comes in from either pipe there, and it filters through, we scrape it off with sieves, and then it goes into the barrel. So, honey soup is full, we use a plastic sheet, this is kind of new to a lot of people. We use a plastic frame cover on everything now. We don't bother with a wooden frame cover because you don't need to. Frame covers cost £12 each. And in, we find in the winter when they're on top of the brood nest, the only good thing about them is if they're uh, a U-shaped frame cover where one side they've got a little gap above. That's the only time they're good is because you can then put a pollen sub on in the spring if you want to feed pollen sub. But for us, we never really have to feed our hives because they're well fed in the autumn. And it makes everything so quick. So if you want to have a super, you can rip that polythene off so quick the bees don't even know what's going on. And you put that other super on and you put the plastic back on before they've even had time to What's going on? And, and you, you go to the next one, you have to be efficient and it enables us to be more efficient. So we also use these uh, these what they're called these are called Batticad. They are made by Nico again. If anyone thinks Nico's corner of the market, they're correct because they make great equipment. But basically these are I would like to actually have a frame of one without the wax on so you can see they're half built up. So there's cells already, those cells you can see there. They're actually only very shallow because they're actually plastic underneath. And all the bees do is they come along, they build onto them, and they then cap them. Now, <coughs> I'm, I can't remember what the next frame. Yeah. If you see that previous or that, that frame, then there's 10 frames on those. 10 frames per honey super. So we have these brand new frames and we have to get them built out. So we have to use some resources from the bees to get those frames built out. But once they're built out, they actually stay waxed. So when you see us harvesting here, there's still 10 frames because these were new last year. But they are now built out those frames. So the next time we use them, we see these are eights. So you can actually put eight frames across here. And they're still, the bees still draw on the frames. They don't build in between the frames. And what does that mean? It means for every super you have, you're actually getting more efficiency. You're getting two extra, two extra frames, less to move around, but more honey. That's how it works. But it's only when you get a bit bigger that you realise you can make these efficiencies and these savings. They're all little things, they all make a difference. So that's a little bit about what we do. So it doesn't matter whether you get honey in the barrel. There's two barrels of honey, chestnut honey, um, just been filled. You know, it's just, we, we simply scrape off the top. That's fairly clean now. If you put that in a maturator, you can then either bottle it or that. That was probably just put the lid on. We we'll take it outside. We we'll put it in, in a cool place in a room where it's like eight to ten degrees. We've got a cooling system, and it keeps it a little bit cool. It helps helps the layer of crystallisation. But when we sell it in bulk, we don't care if it's crystallised. They just they just reheat it. It's no big deal. This was new to me. Three or four years ago, I was thinking we can't sell that. It's crystallised. And I've been I've been selling crystallised honey in pots to other people, and I'm thinking mm, it's not really the best thing. But no, that's. It's all, all people who produce honey wholesale, they all reheat the honey because it's the only way you can deal with it. So, there's some nice honey. <laughs> you recognise the name on the lid? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, my point here is, it doesn't matter whether it's in the barrel or whether it's in the pot. What you need is prolific queens. 
You need good strong queens to make good hives, you know. You can't have weak colonies <coughs> producing rubbish queens and, and rubbish. It's, it just doesn't work. You, you have, to, have to have good queens, you know. This is a queen we, we made. Uh, what the queen was year before last, I think. What were we now? Yeah, year before last. I'm forgetting that. I'm just going to have a mouthful of water, excuse me. Growing up here. So, why should we try and raise good queens? Don't the bees do a good enough job? Well, to me, catching swarms and waiting for swarms is unreliable. You don't know the age of the queen, you don't know where she's been, nine times out of ten. Yes, she's likely to be from your bees, okay, I'll give you that. But you still don't really know when you're going to get a swarm. You can put out swarm traps, and yet again, you don't know where that swarm's come from. You also don't know when it's going to arrive, and you had a lot of resources tied up. You might have used nukes as swarm traps. You might have put inside the best possible formula you could have. You saved some, some frames. You put lemon glass on, and you put Nazanoff in. You've used a propolized hive that is really perfect for a swarm to go in. But I used to put out, uh, the year before last, I was still trapping black bees, local stock, and I caught about 31 swarms, uh, 32 swarms in one year. And I had a really good success rate, but, but, but a lot of my colonies, a lot of the boxes I put out, sorry, didn't get anything in, and then the wax moth moves in, and you've got to look at that, that's a lot of resources, when you can do better than that. Importing bees from faraway places, you might have seen Mike Palmer's thing about buying bees in packages, or buying bees from faraway places. It's not the best thing, you can make better bees with the stock you've got, with a bit of work. They're better suited to your area. They're that the bees you raise, you know where they come from, you know what they've gone through, you've selected them. You're going to get overall improvement to your stock, okay? You're going to have better honey crops, you're going to have healthier bees. You're going to have overall improvement to pest and disease resistance by breeding from queens that, for instance, don't have chalk brood. The thinking now is, and most people are agree with this, if you breed out chalk brood, you never breed or graft from a chalk brood economy, you breed out other things like fowl brood, European fowl brood because the bees become more hygienic. You get rid of them, you get rid of the unhygienic bees in your stock. Whenever I catch, as I said before, I still put out some form of traps because I try and trap near my apiaries in the attempt that if one of my swarms, one of my colony swarms, I might get it back in a box somewhere rather than it going in the neighbor's chimney. It's kind of a bit of a polite way of keeping the peace sort of thing, you know? Um, we, I, whenever I trap one of those, when I put a trap out and I get feral bees in, the first thing I see when I inspect it after three weeks is chalk brood. Almost every time I see some chalk brood mummies, and they don't clean them out. So I just requeen that colony. I just give it a new queen with a better genetics. Improved honey crops. You'll get better honey, more prolific queens with stronger colonies. It's a win win situation, you know? Less warming. For two reasons. One, your queens don't get old. And two, you're replacing them at a programmed interval. So if, if, you, if you make the queen at August one year, and you allow it to, to be in a, in a hive the second year, if you replace it at the end of the third year, if it hasn't swarmed, you, you're going you're to win. You're going to have a, a stronger colony the, same, the following year, it will still be strong. Because if you've replaced that queen, you've given it a new, really prolific young queen. So in terms of production of nukes, if you produce your own queens, you can speed up your production. You can raise some good queen cells that I'm going to go through next. And half the production cycle, or two thirds of it, is speeded up. Because you're getting rid of the bit where the bees have got to make their own queen cell with their own rubbish genetics. You're putting the queen cell in that nuke that is the queen cell you want at the right time you want. So that she's only got to go up and make and she comes back to lay and the nuke's made. You've gained six days. That's what you can do. You also get better mating because you're doing it at a time when you think the bees are going to be best. You're doing it at a time. You're not having to put the bees through making a new queen because you perhaps made nukes too early and the weather went off, you know? Or you killed a queen in your colony by mistake and you're thinking, is she going to make a new one or not? Is there anything I can do when I've got no queens? If you have queens ready, you can just requeen that colony. Overall, the improvement is enormous, you know? So, how can you raise good queens? You need to have a realistic plan. Okay? This is what we all need to think about. 
You need to look at your requirements. What are you trying to achieve? Look at the resources you've got, and look at the season and your nectar flows. Now you guys, who are all beekeepers, will know your nectar flows. I'm thinking generally of people who are maybe a, a beginning beekeeper who wants to raise a few queens, and there are some who want to try, believe you and me. <laughs> but perhaps I should wait for a, a couple of years, but you, you have to be realistic, and you, and you should consider working with one or two people, because if you pull your resources, you will get much better results, and you're not going to lose, you're only going to gain. Because in Jersey, for instance, you're all basically in the same mating pool. You're all, one, one queen bee can fly, can fly eight kilometers. So most of the drones are going to mix here. Most of the drones are going to make with everything else. <coughs> Not guaranteed, but there's a pretty good chance that, you know, queens can fly a long way. Yeah. And so can drones. So, which queen rearing method is for you? This is the big question, okay? As you know, there's many methods. There's many people who know many methods, and granddad knows one way, and so so down the road knows another. You can buy books. I've got some books here on by Snowbro, by um, Miller, some books like that. You can read all them, and you still won't know which one's the best for you because you, you really have to try one. You have to try several and find one that works for you. Okay? Nowadays, we kind of put all these aside and we seem to settle on a swarm box starter and a queen right finisher. Okay? That's what we generally use. There's nothing wrong with the old methods. And some people will like, for instance, like the, uh, the um, they like to they use a specific method. But I tend to use this method. And one, once I teach them this, they tend to be hooked on it. You know, it's, it's a really good method. So when's the right time to attempt to make queens? Let the bees tell you. Let them tell you when they're ready. When are they ready? Well, what happens when they start swarming? What, do, what happens when they swarm? They produce drone cells. So you know that they're going to start, they're going to start producing queens. So when they're swarming is a good time. Okay? Naturally, late spring and summer are the best times of year. Higher forage numbers bring in plenty of pollen <coughs> and nectar during nectar flows. Good mature drones available to fly. Warm on warm summer afternoons. That's what you want. You want to try and refine your. We have to try and start in May because we've got a lot to make and we want to get through a lot of production. We want to set up colonies as quick as we can. We, you guys might say, right, let's do it in June. We know where there's, we know a certain periods good in June, so you can you can do it then. I say the presence of drone brooding colonies is a good indicator that if if you've got queens that need mating, they will get mated. So. Quick break, excuse me. So we need to look at the bees to understand when and how the bees make their queens. There are three basic methods, which you probably all know, but I'm just going to rattle through them quickly so you understand why we do what we do. There are three methods that when the bees make their, bees need to make queen cells. Understanding this will help you learn. Okay, the first natural way the bees make the new queen, the emergency response, okay? The queen suddenly killed, or she's missing in the colony. Probably crushed by the inexperienced beekeeper. Okay. Oh my god, what have I done? Bees immediately grow up one or more cells in the work in the work brood. Okay? Cells are generally in the middle of the frame. They're not big cells. They, the bees draw up, a, they, they fill a cell with raw jelly from, from where that larvae was positioned when she hatched, and they just build it out. And you get these sort of small, stumpy cells mid frame Difficult to cage, difficult to do anything with, and also it's difficult to, to look at them to see when they're gonna when they're gonna hatch, you know? So there's some emergency cells. Actually these are quite close to hatching. You can see they've got a little ring around the base, which means they're probably gonna hatch out in one to one to two days. A classic frame, I, I see this all the time because I make nukes and four days before four days after I make the nukes I go and cut out emergency cells so that I don't have Bees. I still got a lot, a lot of nasty stuff. Don't get me wrong. If I don't cut out the emergency cells and make them hopelessly queenless, my bees are more likely to kill my new queen when she emerges and, and leave one of their, one of their, one of their cells. Okay, so that's what I do. So I see this all the time. Nice frame that you know, brood emerging, no problems at all. So there's some emergency cells that are on a mini plus frame. Exactly the same. We've harvested the queen four days before. We haven't been back in time to put a new virgin queen in because we can't get around everything all the time. It, it happens, you know. Um, and there's some emergency cells being made on, on the end of that code. 
The second natural way bees produce queens, the supersedure method. Have you ever opened your economy and found two queens on the frame, but one next to each other? One's the existing Mars queen and one's the, a new virgin queen, you're scratching your head going, well, where did that come from? Well, it's probably been superseded, okay? They draw up usually a single cell, maybe, maybe a couple of cells, often it's a single one, mid to upper part of the frame. The cells are allowed to hatch out, but they're still present, but underperforming queens. So the bees think there's something wrong with her. So she's underperforming. Is the, 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 the underperforming queen is allowed to live while they're, this is the difference, she's allowed to stay laying while they build a new virgin, while they construct a new virgin queen cell. When the new queen, queen emerges, she goes off, sorry, she goes off and mates, comes back, and then within a few days she's laying, three days she starts laying, and then they ball the existing queen. Now this, this is perfect for the colony, because at no time is that, are they without a laying queen. And it's a really good method but for us to produce queens. It's like the worst possible method, because we can't do anything with that colony. We just have to leave it there. What I would do personally is I come along, if I find this, I take the, the viable queen, put her in a, in a nuke, and make a nuke of it, and I leave the virgin in there, because that virgin has been made, providing they're fairly nice bees, I'll let, them re, let, them, let that virgin carry on and renew the colony. But there's not much you can do, and you can't do anything, you can't produce any cells in the numbers. So, there's a supersedure cell, and it's almost built out from the frame. It's not like an emergency cell, it's part of the frame. You can, you can see it's like, like an acorn hanging down here. So the third natural way, the swarming impulse. You all know about swarming impulse. You all know about that, <laughs> I hope. Okay? So bees in a proliferate colony are running out of space with a huge amount of natural resources coming into the colony. The queen feels it's time to swarm. She wants to reproduce. She wants to make a split. She oversees the production of swarm cells usually found in the lower part of the frames. But she's actually overseeing this. She's actually <coughs> allowing the bees to, to let that larvae hatch and then they will flood that with raw jelly while she's present. And this is the key because when you talk about terms of cast determination, that larvae is turned into a queen cell at the earliest possible time. And that's why the cells are so full of raw jelly. If you ever open queen cells, they're absolutely packed full of raw jelly. That's the ones you want. And that's what we want in our cell builder. They're the, the best type of queen cells you you can have. So, the cells can be harvested, but they're still awkward, but they are more accessible for us. And if you get your timing right, you can usually get a few queens if you find the colony that's about to swarm, you know. But we don't want that either, really, but we, it's good to observe it because it, it helps us understand the process. There you go. Lovely swarm cells. All of them are they're long, they're from the bottom of the frame, so they're not up inside the cell where they were made in the emergency method. But it still doesn't give us many cells we can use easily that, excuse me, that are easily accessible. They're still, we've still got to juggle around. Either, you can put a little gauze cage around them, you can try and capture them, and this is probably the easiest scenario to do that, but it's still not the best way. So none of these methods we've gone through really produce enough queens in any way and the amount we need, okay? However, if you combine the two methods, if you get an enormous colony and you combine the swarming impulse with the emergence response, you can get great results and usable cells because you use uh, frames of larvae that you can put in the hive and then you can use these cells. They're, they're available to us at, when, at the times we want. So there you go, the swarming impulse and the emergency response produces the greatest amount of cells. So, little quote here, you can raise a few good queens from less than ideal stock under ideal conditions rather than trying to raise ideal selected stock under poor conditions. Mike Palmer, brilliant beekeeper. I visited him in 2015 and worked there for a week. And boy, <coughs> you learn a lot when you work with him, I tell you. Amazing, amazing guy. This is what it's all about. The raw jelly. I like it. Um, you see there, these queen cups here, I've got the little cup that they sit in, it's clear, that's the little cup we graft into, 
I'm not asking you to actually look at it, but basically it's a clear cut. Now what I, oh, sorry, I've gone forward uh, on there. What I see when I look at that is I see royal jelly in, in the cells, and that's what you want. You want them so strong that all they do is flood those cells with royal jelly. Okay, so there we go. All royal jelly in there, introducing the cell builder. That's how we get those cells full of royal jelly. Okay, we take them a really strong colony that's on the point of swarming. Okay. It's, it's close to swarming, you know it's that time of year, the colony is so prolific, but then you give it 10 frames of brood. You give it more, 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 more frames. You go to your nucleus colonies and you harvest them. And it combines a swarming impulse with the emergency response. It's so overwhelmingly full of nurse bees after those 10 days that all they want to do is swarm. But then what you do is you make it hopelessly queenless. You then manipulate it, and I'll ex explain the manipulation. It's very simple, but you have to follow the process so that there's no way that those bees can make a new queen. Because what is a hopelessly queenless colony? It's a colony of bees that's lost its queen, its eggs, and its larvae. And there's no way they can make a new queen. And when in nature would this happen? It does happen when you get a when you get laying workers. Basically, they a queen has probably gone off to mate, not come back. And there's no eggs or larvae in that colony for them to make a new queen. It's exactly the same thing, but we can do it artificially. Okay? So let's have a look at the cycle, and we can understand what we're doing and when we're supposed to do it. Okay? So, I actually cribbed this off uh, the website because I couldn't find one quick, uh, that I wanted that was as good as this. It's very simple, but it shows. So this is the day your breeder, your breeder queen, but we're saying a breeder queen here, a breeder hive, but it could be just a hive. If you've got no other, no other bees to grow up from, it could be the hive that you, that's produced you the best crop of honey and it seems to do well in, in the apiary. Why not? Because if it's produced honey, it's been good against mites. It's, it's fought off disease. You could, you could justifiably argue that, you know? But it's not the best way of perhaps selecting a breeder queen. If you've got nothing else, you can do it like that. So, the first three days, the eggs are laid and then they hatch, okay? This is when we graft ourselves. And we call that day one, okay? we call day one of the grafting period, okay? And I refer to day one and day ten because day ten, which is um, here, which is ten days after, is the day we use because if we don't get the cells out of the cell group or out of the incubator or out of the finisher, wherever you decide to put them, and that's what you can do, you've got lots of choices, they will probably start hatching the day after, so you don't want to hunt that. Unless you've got them caged, which is another thing. So there you go, there's um, the queen of cell build, the queen hatches out, and then into mating loops, okay? So you graft on day four, capped over day eight, which is day five of the grafting period, and then into mating loops on day 14, which is day 10, as I just said. So here's the cell builder. I've got one here that I'm not going to follow on as I, as I explain this, but if you want to ask questions about it after, I'm more than happy to go through it because it's pretty simple, okay? So, this, this part here is your normal colony that was strong on the point of swarming. Here I've given it a honey soup because it's honey soup because at the time I built this, it was a flow on. And I didn't want them to, to swarm, so I wanted to give them more space, you know, because I knew it was going to be a cell builder. So then, this is the brood I have on top, the 10 frames of brood. And on top of that, I have a feeder. Believe it or not, I still feed when there's a flow on. Because what happens at night? What happens if it rains? You want a constant feel of feed going to the colony because it gives those bees the feeling that they can build, 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 and they want them to flood those cells. They need carbohydrate, they need food. Okay? So, also, there's a queen excluder there. Okay? So, the queen that's in here can't get up in there. And when I put the brood in, I selected brood that was from cat brood about the hatch. So, there's very few cells in there. So, the queen can't do anything else. This is just going to be bees that hatch out in that, in that top box, okay? So, just to run through that again, 10 minutes before we think we want to graph, we select an already strong colony and check it for queen cells. Why do we check it for queen cells? Because you can't have a cell in the cell builder, okay? We're trying to make cells, but we don't want to hatch out before and kill all the larvae, because that's, the, that's what the queen does. It's not her that cleans up after, she just goes and tears down cells. It's the queen that tears them down. The bees just clean up the mess afterwards. So above the queen excluder, we add 10 frames of brood, harvested from our adjacent nucleus colonies, recording dates and times. Make a note of it, so you don't forget the process you're working to. 
And believe it or not, you can forget a simple date like that and you go, oh, when did I have that brood? And because we were so busy that time of year. So this is me adding a brood, it's not the best of picture, but it gives you some idea. This isn't the best frame of brood, but it, it's what I'm trying to say is it's, you're just looking for good frames, okay? But this, will be, this is honey, you know, in there. Um, and the, you've got to be careful because there may be some larvae here that's not capped over. Okay, so that's something to think about when we're ready to make it into a queenless colony, okay? A queenless setup. I'll explain it when we get there. So here we are, day 10. This is taken from my video, by the way, so I can show you the steps of how I create this hopelessly queenless colony, okay? Are you still awake? No delays dies yet. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> right, so 10 days later, we call it grafting day. In the late morning, if the weather's night, I set up the cell builder, okay? This is what I do. So that top box contains the 10 frames of brood I added, okay? But they're all hatched now. Everything is hatched out in the top box, okay? So I take off the top. So I've got my hive tool in there. There's my hive tool, there's the queen excluder, let's see. The queen hasn't laid up in there that whole time. It's just hatched bees and brood. There might be a tiny bit of brood in there. There could be the odd little raft of it that was, that was eggs when I put it in. But mostly it's hatched brood, okay? So I take off the top box and I put it to one side. It's out of the way. It's gone. Those nurse bees, the majority of it is nurse bees, so they won't fly. They just stay in there for the minute while I just sort the next bit out. So this bit here is the queen-like section of the colony, okay? So I'm going to move that now away. <coughs> we remove the bottom box and rotate it 180 degrees. So I'm going to move it from there to here. I move it away from the colony. So I'm swarming this queen. I'm creating an artificial swarm at the same time, okay? But I'm taking everything with her because there's no eggs in anywhere else. I'm taking the eggs, the brood, and the larvae at the same time away from that colony, okay? Which is why a cell border is so good, because you can really manipulate it as you want. So there you go. And let's move this on. So I'm picking up the bottom box, moving it around. There. It's reversed now. There's the entrance, okay? This side now. It was here before, and now it's here. So all the bees fly from here, <coughs> fly back to here. But they've got nothing. There's nothing there. So what do I do? I put a base down in exactly the same place, okay? A new base is put down on the same place, Exactly the same place, it has to be the same place, okay? So then the bees just continue to fly back to that. So the bees leaving here behind the foraging that have just come out to deliver their nectar and their pollen are going to return back to here. And what do they find when this box is on here? They find that the queen's gone, and they find there's no eggs and no larvae, and they suddenly find they're hopelessly queenless, okay? That's how you create a hopelessly queenless colony. But that's not it. That's just the preliminary setup, okay? So I've just moved this top box there was, was underneath this one. I've just juggled them around, but because I can do it and I have a queen excluder there, I don't put any eggs or larvae into this position here, okay? So, next section. I check this box for queen cells. You cannot have a cell in a cell builder, okay? It's the biggest mistake people make. They get all this setting up done, they make it perfect, and they forget to look properly. You shape every bee or every frame, and you check the queen cells. Because what happens is when you elevate brood above the queen excluder, like, like happens in the summer, what, where, where, where's the scenario you get it? In supers in the summer. Okay, if the bee's laid in there, you put the queen excluder on, you go back, check the frames, and see if the queen's hatched out. Well, it's queen cells, and I didn't put them in, because you had larvae in there before, because they're away from the queen pheromone, okay? and they, they draw up cells, okay? So you must check every frame. So I go through the whole box, and I check every single frame that there's no queen cells in that box. Because if I leave one, all my cells are ruined, okay? And then I use my shaker box. What's a shaker box? It's a super with a queen, with a queen excluder fit to the bottom of it. And why do I use it? So I can shake these from this part of the colony, it was on the bottom, that had the queen in. But what happens if I don't use a shaker box? The queen might get shaken back in the box I'm just trying to get rid of queens from. You follow? Yeah. I have to get it queenless. I cannot have a cell or a queen in the cell builder. So you've got to be meticulous, okay? And it's not just the queen. 
It might be multiple queens. What if they're going through super procedure? What if there were some swarm cells that hatched out because the weather went rubbish and they didn't swarm? They had still had swarm cells. Sorry, they still had virgin queens running around in the bottom box I didn't know about. You get rid of them by shaking everything through that. Now, I'm shaking bees from this part, but I'm going to leave just enough in here to keep the brood warm, okay? You can't shake everything out. You have to leave a certain percentage. But if I leave a lot of these bees in here, they're kind of a resource I'm wasting because most of them are nurse bees and they will stay where I put them because they don't fly. They're under three days old or, or, or more. And if I get them back into this box, they're only going to do good by being in that box. So I, I shake them out there, leaving just enough room. And what does that do to that queen in there? Because she was on the point of swarming. It actually changes her manner. She suddenly goes from having so much food coming in to massively reduced foragers and loads of eggs, loads of room to lay in and, and hardly any workers. And it switches off that swarming impulse from the queen. So you're controlling your queen at the same time with this method. You, you don't lose on any, anything if you do it properly. So there's me, shaking bees through the excluder. And by this, we maximize the brood nest, this hopelessly queenless colony we've created. We just make it stronger and stronger and stronger. And then all the time, there's bees coming back to the front of this because we've shaken out, so we, we reverse the box the other side. So it's it's also a huge amount of forage bees that are coming to here. And you can see the confusion we get. Now, when you start off this process, sometimes they get a bit stingy and they're a bit like, oh, you know, leave us alone. Within a few minutes you're doing this, it's just chaos. They lose that stinginess, you've taken the queen away, and they just basically start, they start like, you know, there's a rule. They're just bees everywhere, but they're not aggressive. They're just, they're just looking for that queen, they're looking to a lot. They sense their, their hopelessly queenless within 20 minutes, you know. It's, it's, it's amazing. <clears throat> so there's the queen, I'm shaking through, trying to get through the excluder. I don't spend time anymore looking for the queen on the frames because there's so many bees in that box you're trying to shake out. It's a waste of time, you know. It'd be nice if we had time, but in the real world it just doesn't happen. So she, what I like to do is I like to find her, or at least a queen, and I've got her because if I don't find her I'm worried. Because I'm still, because she can fly sometimes. I've had them fly and go back in the front, and if I don't find them, like, and you put your cells in and they don't get drawn up, and you know why, because she's in there. She's in there stopping them drawing the cells up. So, that's the result, okay? Pretty spectacular when you see it. Here we have a hopelessly queen in setup. The bees are completely lost. They are, they're in a state. They're, they're flying around. If you stand back where you, from where you're, say my cell door was there, you can see this cloud of bees just like slowly fly around there. They're in this like state, they're lost. They've got no, they've suddenly lost everything they have. They're, they're most valuable possession, they're queen. And they've got nothing to make a new one with. Okay? And here we leave two frames in the middle, one for the graft and one for a pollen frame. Okay? Very important, you, well, I'll show you the pollen frames next, but you must have two spaces in the middle at least for your pollen frames. You've got to give the pollen right next to where your larvae are. So, pollen frames must be added next to where the larvae go, and they can come from queenless colonies in your apiary. What happens when the colony becomes queenless, or they, they stop working? There's a build-up of pollen. They still forage, they still bring back pollen, but often you find in a, in a queenless colony, you'll get pollen frames. You can find them from strong working colonies. And it's interesting that, because if you, if you notably find a, a colony that has uh, a really good pollen frame in, amongst others. You make a note of it because when you're selecting criteria for future stocks, you might want to breed from that colony because it's a really good pollen producer. I've had years where there's no pollen, yet two colonies or one colony just is exceptionally always full of it. It's, it's peculiar. But those are the ones you want to you make a note of. And you can make a pollen frame. You can either trap some pollen in your traps in another, in another acre, trap 20, 30 pounds of pollen in the early spring when you've got the old seed breaking flower. And, and everything else, like I said, is coming through the door. And you pour that pollen, you can freeze it, you freeze it down, and you pour that pollen off the frame and you rub it in. And you make the best pollen frame the bees have ever seen. But it works. There you go, that's the kind of pollen frame you sometimes get. This is probably more than from the queenless colony. But that's what I want to see. I want, I want a diversity, a good diverse amount of pollens, and I would also like to see some, some honey in as well. Because having honey next to the Right next to the larvae is more carbohydrate for them to, to use if it rains, if the weather has done. What I'm saying is, we overdo everything. 
it probably won't rain because it's a nice because you're grafting in the sunshine, you're putting the colony together in the sun, you know, it's nice weather. It probably won't be rubbish weather, it'll probably be good, and there'll be loads of food coming in, but if you give them more, if it does go off, you're covered, and you won't have any problem with your queen cells. This pollen frame was from the chestnut last summer. Look at that, it's just packed, there's no room in it. That's the kind of frames I like. Maximum nutrition. So here's me making a frame with, um, I, can't, I can't read the name there, but it's B Pro, I think. I've tried it, it's, it's all right. You're better off with natural pollen though, but it works. If, if you come to a dearth in your production, and for instance, when we have hit this post-harvest in July, when the end of the nectar flow is with us, we get six weeks of, or eight weeks of nothing before, until the ivy starts, and I mean hardly anything. And trying to find a pollen frame after three weeks is a nightmare. You can, for your last graph, you can do this. It's, it works, you know. You have to be resourceful and just do what you can. So, breed your queen stock. Next big question is where do you get your breed queen from? Do you buy one in? You can. You, you can go to a, a breeder, a buckfast breeder, or a, a carny island breeder and say, I want a good stock for grafting from. You'll charge you 300 quid for it, but it's a good thing to do because if you've got an area where you haven't enhanced your genetics for a long time and you're finding everything, even though you're trying your hard to select good genetics and the traits you want, Bringing in fresh genetics is a good idea because it helps stop in breeding and you'll get stronger, more vigorous colonies. But when you're selecting yourself, you should go to your own colonies and you should make a yard sheet and you should try and write down through the year things like, are they docile? Do you want bees that every time you go to the colony they're banging off your face or they're running off the frame? And if you hold the frame like this, like there's bees pouring, you can see them pouring off back into the hive. I don't want bees like that. I have colonies that do that. But they're the cranky ones, right out, miles out. I, I'm getting miles away from everywhere. I just leave them all, all the rubbish far in. They still produce honey, but I don't like working with them. So I get rid of them. Okay? Disease resistance. We talked about this before. You select stock that doesn't have chalk brood. You never graft from a chalk brood. It's one of the fundamental no-nos now of is basic queen ring. And this is basic queen ring. We're not talking breeder queens here. We're, so breeder level. We're just talking about what you can do to make good queens. You, you select against um, chalk brood. You just don't graph from a chalk brood colony. And then immediately you start finding that all the daughters you produce that year and the next year don't have chalk brood. It's actually very simple to breed it out. It doesn't take long. Okay? VHS, varroa sensitive hygienic bees. Do your mite counts. Do a mite wash. Check, the, check your mite boards. Do it regularly. Monitor your mites. Look at before treatment, after treatment. I could go into this, but I've got to be a bit careful because it's like quite a complicated subject because don't forget now we're talking about grooming bees as well when we're talking about the HS. We're talking about bees that are ankle biters, that they learn to groom the mites because the, the mites hold on by their feet. The same as when oxalic acid is used, it burns their feet and they fall off. That's how oxalic acid works. And grooming bees nibble the feet of the mites, okay? But it's what they're looking into, it's the latest thing they're looking at, they're trying to be breed grooming bees. But VHS stock is more looking at bees that know there's a female varroa breeding underneath that cap larva, and they yank it out. So you go to your frame, and you think, oh, this queen's not really good. She's like, look, it's all spotty. But is that a bad lane queen, or is it where the bees have yanked out that larva because they butchered it because they knew it was full of reproducing varroa underneath it? That's what you should think about. Try and think about that when you're selecting stock. I know at our level, and I'm still talking about my level as well, it's not going to make a huge difference, but it, if you think about it and consider it, you might think, oh right, well that one did well, or that one seems to be less on bright. It's something you can think of, you know? Overwintering cluster size. You go to a colony, there's like a little grapefruit with bees uh, in, in March, you go, you know, and then the other ones are booming. Why do you get that? Don't breed from that one when it gets stronger in the spring. Don't breed from that one. You know, you want a strong build-up so you get that by having strong queens in the spring. Sorry, and, and, and populous colonies when they start off again. Spring build-up. Count the frames of brood in the spring. How strong are they actually building up? You know, how quickly do they build up? You, you can compare hives, and you might find one hive that's particularly more. Write it down. So when you come to select that breeder quick, well, this did, this school, this, this, and this, I really think we should breed from this one. Overall, it might not be brilliant. But if you start selecting that method in two or three years' time, you'll actually have good genetics. Honey crop versus post-harvest feeding. The biggest thing of all, oh, my hive was fantastic, I got 80 pounds out of it. Well, how much, sorry, how much did you, did you feed it? Well, I fed 40 pounds of sugar to it. It's like, is that really what you want? You should consider that as well. You 
<laughs> swarming. I'm not going to really talk about that, but some races of bees are more swarming than others. You can certainly breed from queens that, so from stocks that swarm less. That's something to consider as well. So here we have a grafting day in the afternoon. Here I'm removing the larvae from the cells with my Chinese grafting tool, grafting each larvae into a cell cup. I don't pre-manage pre, uh, my cups, I just take the cups out of the box, I buy them in, stick them in the frame and graft into them. You can, people say you should polish them, you should, sorry, you should put them in the colony to get the bees to polish them, you should pre-fill the, the cell with some sterile water or some raw jelly. I found it makes no difference because you're making a cell builder that is so strong and all the bees are one are doing is to sweat and produce exude the raw jelly, so anything you put in a cup is going to be flooded with raw jelly very shortly, so you, it's almost like they, they'll save your they'll do a bit of work for you so there's me, so you're grafting into the cups there it's not difficult to graft, other people use other methods other people like to they say that grafting is difficult in their eyes, which I can understand, some people really struggle with it but I find with my Chinese grafting tool, you're lifting up a puddle of raw jelly when you're grafting, you're scooping out, it's like having a spoon, you're scooping out that larvae, and the larvae is sitting in the raw jelly. So, you do the reverse, you just float it back off the tool and back into the, the bottom of the other cell. So you, it, you don't have to have the best eyes, but there's um, uh, another method, or two other methods, made, well, Nico made one, and I can't for the remember the name, excuse me, of the other one. But, what you do is you put this uh, pre-made plastic cage into the colony first of all. You then put the queen into that colony, she lays up those, it basically it's a plastic cage containing these cups, okay? The queen lays into the cups, at the right date and the right timing, you remove that cage, you then break off the cups, put them into the cells I've got there, into the cell holders I've got there, and it's the same process without grafting. But I find personally, but it's, it's a long-winded method where I can just go to a colony, yank out a frame and graft from it instantly. And it, it, it creates more headaches. If you're doing a few cells and you haven't got the good eyesight and you're worried about grafting, yes, perhaps that's the method for you. You should look into it, you know. So here's me grafting. You see that larvae there is absolutely tiny. You just see the circle there. It's not, I took, I can tell you honestly, I took about 200 pictures to get this. It's like the most difficult thing to, see every one of these cells has a larvae in. You can only just see there. There's the larvae, there's the larvae. These are actually eggs. They haven't hatched out yet. But it's, it's not, it's when you go, you have to sacrifice the good picture of that for the poor picture of that. There's not a camera I found that will take the best, I'm sure if I had more equipment that was, you know, better, better equipment, I'll probably get better pictures. But that's basically what I do, okay? It's never easy. So there you go, that's the, the larvae in the cell cup, sitting in its puddle of raw jelly. You, we then take it down to take it down to the cell builder and in goes the grafted larvae, okay? Now, you can't see many bees here because I've just, I actually have to smoke this colony because sometimes they do get a bit aggressive, okay? And in my video, if you watch it, you'll see this moment, but I have one or two colonies that occasionally don't behave themselves. It's just the way bees are. But you put the frame in, and the frame doesn't move. It's so full of bees underneath. You have to wait for the frame to sink down like that. They're like, they've got to shuffle their shoulders a bit, and that frame goes, and that's what you want. You want it so full okay, of, of bees. And they're so desperate to jump on those cells, and that's what they do. Okay? So then I push the frames together. These four, so that one there will be the graft, and that one there, so that's the graft, it's the narrow frame. That there's my bottom frame. And that'll be a frame with some brew and probably some stores there. But I push them together, so it means that the bees can, can kind of form a raft better, where they can work on those cells better, because don't forget they're going to be moving between the pollen and the nectar, and you want to create the best possible scenario for them to do that, okay? And bees from, from all around the colony, all around here, will come in, because they'll, they'll, they'll somehow they'll understand there's larvae there that need to be worked on, and that's what they do. That's why you put tons of nurse bees in, because that's what nurse bees do. So, when I push the frames together, you see I've, I've got castellations in all my hive, and I take out them. If you're wondering how I, it's a little thing, but if you're wondering how I push the frames together, I take off the castellations, because it just makes it easier to slide them together. So it's like, uh, you know, simple. 
So, 24 hours after the cells have been in the cell starter, I move into the finisher, okay? Now, personally, I do this method because it works for me because I need a lot of cells quickly, okay? But there's two times a year where I make splits from all my production colonies. And then the week after, I need a maximum amount of cells. So I do this method because it enables me to, make, to put more cells through the whole process really quickly. You could perfectly reasonably leave those cells in the cell builder today to day five, and on day five, you'd reassemble the colony. Remember I showed you breaking it down, and we took the queen slither off. You, you reassemble it exactly the same as it was when you first started it, and you put the cells, sorry, <laughs> you put the cells back in, and you put them above the queen excluder, and they must be above the queen excluder, and then the, cells, the cell builder becomes the finisher. Okay? There's no reason why you can't do that. But I do this method, because what I like to do is, as soon as I've harvested them, I gap up where, so there's, that one's not been accepted, that one has, that one's not been accepted, nor that one, but that one has, that one has, that one has. I do more cells than I need, because what happens is, with these, if you leave them more than 24 hours, they start to reduce the number of accepted cells, okay? So you go in as early as you can, you yank them out, and then you, you, you get rid of your non-accepted cells and interchange them so you can put a complete cell bar in a finisher with, with 14 <coughs> cells on the, that are started. Okay? So you don't have to carry through empty cells through the grafting process. All right? And I do this because it means, like, as I said before, I can make a lot of cells quickly. So then, there's my cells there. This is one of my finishers. Okay? I, part, I literally part the frames. This is five frames over five frames. Underneath here is a queen excluder. The queen can't get up in here, but this is a strong, small colony of ten frames, five over five, that has the queen underneath, that these bees will then jump on those cells and finish them off, okay? So, that's what I was on about, okay? You can see there, five over five, all right? Very simple, I start these colonies off in, my, my I overwinter my colonies on five frames most of the time. In polynutes, I win them on six because they're six frames. But these boxes are the first ones I ever made, and I still use them, they work just fine. And I overwin I win my bees on five frames. In the spring, I put a top on them, and then they grow into, they double their size, they grow into their top boxes. And when I'm ready to use them as finishers, I lift off the top box, quick put a queen excluder in, find the queen, whether she's in this box or this box, and put her back in this box so I know it's safe. And by creating these finishers, I can free up my cell builder to start the next lot. So that same day, my cell builder becomes free again. And believe it or not, the second batch you put in, you get more acceptance because the, the, the nurse bees in there are more akin to drawing up cells. In a lot of French breeders, they don't actually keep their first set grafts. They just bin them because they want the second batch because they know the second batch are even better at drawing up queen cells. But I don't go down that road. I find I get perfectly good acceptance. The other issue is, if I, um, see so there's my cells going in, I'll, I'll just finish this, this section first. You need to manage your finishes, but I can explain a bit about that later. Okay, and there's my cells coming out on day six after they've been capped, okay? Because all they're doing is finishing these cells. So you've got a queen in there. She's underneath the excluder. So she can't come up, you see. Well, that's still not going to supersede, like they're swarming in. Probably. No. There's all these queen cells. They, she doesn't know it's up there. And it's a very good question, but I actually asked the professional this, and they say, it doesn't bother her at all. And the bees will just naturally draw that anyway. The bees only think, they're not thinking that's queen cells. The bees think it's a cell that needs to be finished. Okay. And they just, because the, the, work, the work is in the first five days. Okay. After, after they're capped, it, it doesn't really matter. As long as they're kept warm. They just, because yeah. the larvae inside are pupating to become... Adult, uh, adult virgin queens. The metamorphosis is separate to the to the building section, you know. Right. So there's my cell build my my cells. I then move them out to the to the incubator because then it frees up my cell finishers. It's you see the process now. You could go from one to the next to the next. And at the start, as I said, you could just leave them all in the cell builder to day five because you only want to make twenty cells because that's all you and your mate wanted to do. But that's fine because it works for you and. and it enables you to make 20 good cells. No, no problem at all. But this is what I do. There we go. So this is a, excuse me, a quick slurp. This is a, a kind of, I like this picture because these are all uh, different finishes. 
except each, each biofilm, it just shows you that each colony uses different kinds of wax and propolis. That's all it is. But they're all put in the same time, they're all just finished slightly differently. It's just a bit of interest. You know which one I like. <laughs> you can see the best cells there, these ones. <laughs> but unfortunately, they're not all like that. We try and get them all like that. You know? <coughs> Okay, so I've got a, a really small incubator, and it holds up to about 80 cells if I'm lucky. But I, want, I need another one soon. But um, between day six and ten, you can move the cap cells to the incubator, and then you can recombine the colony, as I said before, and or, or use it as a finisher. It's up to you. But I run it again and again. I run it three times. Okay. The possibilities really are endless of, what, of how you make your cells and what you want to do. Once you understand the principles and how to set it up, you can, you can really do what, work, work it for you. And that's what I do. Yeah. So, what can you do with your queen cells? You can use them in splits. You, you go to your, your production hive where you've harvested your honey. For example, or say you've got a load of uh, colonies that are getting too strong and you think, well, how am I going to manage this right? I'll make some, I'll make some splits. You go from five days before, you, you cut your bees out, you put in two frames of bees and brew, you add another honey, shake some more bees in, that's the colony. Five, say, uh, the day before your queen cells are ready, you go and cut out the queen cells. This is what we do, other people do it differently, but we cut out the queen cells so that the cells going in are more likely to be accepted. So they won't. We sometimes use um, either tin foil around the cell to protect the cell or cell protectors. But uh, just in case, because don't forget, a queen cell isn't attacked from the end, so they can still hatch out, but it's the side they're always destroyed from. So, if if um, if, if another queen gets in, or the bees don't like it, they'll, they'll destroy it. You know? But as long as the tip's clear, they'll um, she'll hatch out. You can make up mini plus mating links, which is what we do for one of our main bulk of uh, queen production in the summer. Okay, it, it's a small small colony. We've got one here. That allows um, for expansion and division and mating of uh, queen bees with small amounts of, of bees and brood. You're not using big resources, okay? And you can sell queen cells to other people. Often we transport them in like a flask on, on day 10. Some people say, oh, well, I'm going to make some nukes like I've just explained, and, and you give them some of your queen cells to put in their nukes. It's, it's a simple process. So this is my colleague Christian uh, in one of, his, one of the um, the mini plus mating yards. Um, all these are one and two. See, so that's that's the basic height. So underneath here, we've got a round white plastic feeder, which is every one of these. Excuse me, has a feeder like this on. If you see that, it's, it's a rapid feeder like everyone uses. And um, under all those lids, we've got room for one of those. Okay, so we can leave that. We put that one on, and it stays there all year. So when it when the flow's on, we just leave it there. When they start to get hungry again, or so we've just done something to the colony, and we put a new queen, and we give them like you know half a litre of syrup again, right? So here is, is I'll say before is the basic size mini plus frame. We get six there's six frames in each mini plus. When we make a colony, the colony grows, and then we can put another story on top of that, so it grows into the next colony. When that's grown, and that's not too strong, and you've got half the season left, you can cut this in two. That take that top bit off. Give it a new base, put a queen cell in, you make another colony. It shows the flexibility you've got in each, each one of the mini plus hives, okay? This is us drawing up frame for the mini plus on top of a six frame nuke, okay? We build them out when they're built out, we go into the harvest of the frames of bees, brood, and honey, and then we build out mini plus frames, okay? That's us harvesting. There's, these are the six frame poly nukes we use. And we have a certain amount we keep, we use for, for brew production in the spring, or we use them for producing mini plus frames. You'll notice that these frames will be going horizontally, sorry, uh, longitudinally from front to back. So these frames go sideways on. But it makes no difference to the bees. But this is a perfect scenario because this box fits perfectly on that. So it's, it's a no-brainer, it just works really well for us. Yeah? So we harvest them and we make up these. They're ready, they've got a queen cell, a small colony with some Usually when we're making up a, a load of mini plus colonies, we go to a, a, a strong colony that's it's got the frames, and we harvest a frame of brood, another frame or a half frame of brood, a frame of honey, and then another one partially built. So we've got 
brood going into that colony, and then we shake some bees in. You must have brood in each one of these colonies, because brood is hatching, eventually, and it gives the bees something to hold on to. It gives them like uh, a reason to stay there, and they'll, they'll heat that brood. Because if you put a queen cell in the wrong side, they won't heat that place where there's no brood, so you want the, the queen cell where your brood is, and they'll heat that and keep it warm to their hatches. And then within a day, we put these in, uh, we find the cool places, which just one place in the workshop, for example. You'll find that within a day, these are out, and we, there's the queen cell in the top, amongst the brood with the bees there, you see around it, so the heat will be coming up from the bees, keeping that queen cell warm, okay? And that's the, that's the size colony we want when we start. We don't want to use a lot of resources, because we haven't got a lot of resources in the spring. We use the minimum we can to get them going. But it's finding that balance of having a strong enough colony to, colony to get going that doesn't diminish, but enough to, um, to so it flourishes and then gets away. That brood hatches within a couple of days. The brood's hatching, and then suddenly you've got a colony that explodes with a virgin queen that goes off and mates, and it all picks up. Okay. So that's some of our. Uh, <laughs> this is how busy it gets in the summer. On here we haven't got any lids. We just use tiles because they're heavy floor tiles, but they work. <coughs> all it does is keep off a few rain showers. You just use what you have. You know? But we've got, this is one of the, this is like the rear of our, our workshop, because we, our mating station is kind of down the hill in the valley there, so we know the queens mating here will be the same as the ones that mate in the valley, it's, it's, it's so close, so we just use what we have, you know? and you see these are all supers on their sides, that are so knackered that we're just using where we can, you just, you use your resources all the time, using what you have to, to get what you can through, you know, they don't all work, sometimes they become, um, queenless or drone line, we have a fair share of that. I don't think that all these are perfect. There will probably, probably be probably three or four there in that lot that are, that are drone laying, or you know, so we'll have to correct that. We, you know, it's not that easy. It, there's always the downside of it. But you, if you create a lot, the percentages are good and the weather's good, you do end up with some good mating queens. That's what you want to see nice uh, eggs in the cells. See how they're all facing the same way? And they're still, that's the queen that's laid that, so the eggs haven't even started to lie down yet before they hatch out. That's probably day one, day two. And that's what we want to see when we, before we harvest our queens. Nice frames of brood. This, this colony will we be worried about because it's so strong that if we didn't come in and take some of that brood away, we'd have to come and shake these out or it would swarm. One of the problems we have with our finishes, so one of the problems we have with our mini plus frames is we get absconding, where if you get a hot spell and the colony is so small in a, in a sorry, such a strong colony in a small box, they just go. They just abscond. They don't swarm. They don't really call swarm cells. They just take off and go. And you sometimes say, see in peak summer where, where we use other boxes as well. But they just go. They, they're just. And you know, and like it's happened to three or four in a line, and it's because they abscond. It's quite a common thing. Mostly. Uh, people who use a lot of the Apodea mating it's the very small polystyrene ones, you see it a lot in that, because the, there's not enough room for the bees to call, and they just take off and go. But these are more mini plus mating nukes, but these are in my house, these are, these are my stock I overwintered last year. So there are twins, and there's a couple of singles, but mostly twins or even threes. So what we did was in the autumn before, when we wanted a queen, so we're still finding one or two nukes that we had managed to queen, with virgin, cell, with virgin queen cells, we'd go and harvest the queen. And say we had a line of uh, these little hives, we'd, take, we'd pick one where it was next to another one, harvest that queen, and we'd put a sheet of newspaper on top of the adjacent one and give it that body. So we basically put that body, that body there would have been probably here. All you do is you put a sheet of newspaper between the two, score it a bit, dribble some feed on it, and by the time they leave for the newspaper, they've join that colony, so this colony becomes one, but it's not just joining a colony, you're doubling its resources, so it's, it's feeding up for the winter. So as well as harvesting queens, you're safeguarding that existing queen, because you're giving it more resources, you haven't got to feed it so much, so it, it, it works on everything, you know? It, it's really, once you get a system like Mini Plus, Mini Plus has got negatives, but we find they far outweigh, that the positives far outweigh the you system, know, they're really good, really good to use. So, I'll try to explain the other end of the situation now. In the spring, I harvest more queens. And in here, we have one queen. Well, I've added, so say this was the two box and the two box added together. And there's another one on top of that. So you get these long columns of bees, and there's only one queen in that. 
but then they get so strong because they've got all these resources that unless you put them on top of a, a box, on top of a new box, they swarm. So we de-pressurize them. We give them room underneath. So we put a square of this same uh, cardboard style mulching we use for around the hives. We cut a square out. Inside that there's a square. And all it is is a hole through. But as the bees get so strong, they just literally go into the nuke underneath and they populate a nuke. So when we're ready, we've got queen cells ready, that holds them over for a few weeks, and it's often just a few weeks you need, it's not long. You then break these down again, you take that off, you take this off, you take this off, you give it a base, you give it a roof, stick a queen cell in it, and you've got the next colony. It's all about breaking down and building up. You have to have a system that's flexible for you. And that's the same thing, you can see the square there. So, make it up news. I like this picture because it's like a, it's a bit of oldie, it looks oldie moldy, but it's a lot of old news I had, and it's kind of a nice picture. But we use uh, some foam on the front because we find if you use anything else that's clear, the bees always try and get out. But if you use a foam square, it blocks off the front perfectly, you know. And then I take these into the new yard, into a production yard, sorry, work through the, all the colonies, and then um, take th three frames of bees and brood, bees and brood out and make a nuke, and then we go to a seven frame configuration for the winter. This is me in the uh, production yard, so this is our bee escape we use. You can see the triangular lozenge there, okay? That's our bee escape. This is a bee escape board. But when you put on a bee escape board underneath the honey supers, and the colony is really populous, and most of them are, thankfully, when you take off the honey, easy. Walk away the honey frames, no bees fly around, they're all beneath that bee escape. And then you lift up the bee escape when you come back with your nukes, and what's underneath it? Thousands of nurse bees, all, all, all working bees, all trying to get back up into the hive, but they can't. And what do you do? You knock them off into a nuke. Easy. They're just sitting there ready for you. And then you take two more frames of bees and brood out. And we, we tend to use, you can see in there, we've got a uh, partition, that's our partitions, and two more frames of foundation. Okay, So you have to be organised, you need lots of resources, but you can do it easily. In the mating station there, Collecting nukes, or put them, probably putting these out that have been made somewhere else. We generally work on the three kilometre rule. If you're making nukes one area, you move them more than three kilometres away, put them on the ground, make the next lot, move them three kilometres away. It's how we tend to work, because it stops bees flying, it makes it easier. You know, you don't come back to a bench and find a pile of cluster of bees on it. So uh, you're not wasting resources, and the bees are happy. So feeding, every nuke needs to be fed. Every cell builder needs to be fed, regardless of the flow. Okay, I, I learned big lessons this summer that I didn't feed my bees enough um, during the summer months because I didn't have the resources. I fed them enough so they lived, but when the nectar flow came along in, in September time, they weren't able to profit from it because they were so underfed. They were all alive, but the frames were alive. It took them two weeks to recover before they actually start filling up the hive again. You have to feed, pre-feed them so that when a flow does come along, they're ready to take advantage of it. Okay? So all nukes we make, immediately I make up nukes. The first thing I do is, I bought, I bought 300 of these last year, so we've got enough now. Immediately, one of those goes on, and it's filled up with syrup. Okay? And then, immediately, that also does two things. It feeds them, but also, it helps them build out queen cells. And these queen cells you cut out are so full of raw jelly, because they've, the, they've got the resources, you know? That's how we get our syrup, we, we do a group purchase. <laughs> There's a group of beekeepers in Normandy who we team up with, and they use this other guy's bigger than us. You know? We basically have one we call it CETA, and it's a big glory that we, we use this stuff called Fructa Plus. It's actually more, it's, it's got the highest high percentage of fructose sugar in the syrup you can buy.